so that you can make sure that I cover everything even though I intend to. I want to start with the fact that your artwork along, that comes out of your life is the source of every communication that you make. I picked these five areas that are the most common for expressing what it is you're doing and try to bring people into it. And we do try to bring people into our art world where we work. That's the most comfortable for us. But with the internet, we're actually having to go out to the world. And that's the way I, why I called this bringing your, your world to the, to the public because you're gonna have to make an effort to present yourself and create a forum for yourself that people can access. So we're switching it around, we're, we're stretching ourselves and we're pushing ourselves to say, okay, this is who I am and make it available to anyone who wants to see. And you don't know what they're gonna do with it, with that information a lot of times. It's easiest to start with an artist statement because that's a personal expression of what you're doing, why you're doing it, where that whole creativity comes from, what that process is for you. And I gave you worksheets so that you can brainstorm a little bit. And if you look at that first worksheet, I'm always trying to tap into what's inside as the source of the terminology that you will use, um, the spirit that you bring into those written documents, those words, pictures that you will paint or expressions that you will make visual, just like dance or art. It's, I just sort of blogged on my website today or on my LinkedIn page that writing is another form of artistic expression and it's, it's expressing in some form and with color what's inside here, the same as, as art or dance does. So when you work on your artist statement, that's where I'm wanting it to come from. And it's, if you saw my promotional flyer, it, I made the worksheet in a circular pattern as opposed to the linear that this was done because this implies some kind of sequence or some kind of straight line thinking. And what I really want you to do is connect with that core every time you approach any communication that you attempt. So if you do that, you're always coming back to that and that's why I made it a circular pattern for your, the example. So when you go to these worksheets, you are going to have to interpret. This is a using your left brain to access your right brain. And when you do that, it does change. It's, I've noticed that it's like where we, it's like a mirror. You know, we can look outward and we see life a certain way. We can even look at ourselves a certain way as we fit, as we think we fit in society. If you look at a mirror, you have to deal with what people see that maybe you don't see or don't want to acknowledge. And I've seen stories, you've probably seen stories of this where, you know, some strange case where someone's been so secluded they hadn't really seen themselves in a mirror. Right. And what a shock that would be. That's been an interpretation in movies too. And, and it is the same sort of shock when you get feedback say off the internet or something like that, about what, how they perceived your presentation, how they see you. If they see your art, if they see you dance, they're gaining an insight into the inner person by this external expression. Well, it's the same thing with writing, and you don't ever want to conform to some pattern or some mold or some prescription and that's why I made these cues very much a work of finding out yourself what's in there and how to make that an expression that's true. Because I'm not going to say, okay, because I've read plenty of books, the 
the artist statement has to have this, 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 or your resume, this, this, this. You may do that, but if you don't connect that with your core, it's not going to have life to the reader. Okay? So the other way that we show people, so the artist statements statement is about why you're doing what you're doing. What moves you? You know, what compels you? And how does that take shape in your art? The next thing is a very left brain exercise, a biography or personal profile. This is simply chronology, history of you. And some people don't even have anything that they could list, like formal education, ex exhibits they've had. If you don't have that kind of information, you have performances, I'm sure, already. There are, there are events, even if they're not formal, I encourage you to list any event that was meaningful that took you further on your journey as an artist in any way. There, they could be landmarks. And, the, and frankly, for your audience, the more conversational it is, the better. If you use technical language that is only good inside of a formal gallery or business, or if you're trying to get a sponsor or a, someone to fund your art, that language is going to be completely different. Most people, you, do you know why they buy your art or why they come to your performance? What is it that motivates them? Sometimes it's very disappointing for an artist to find out they're just looking for a piece of art that has a certain color that matches their living room scheme. It's nothing any more interesting than that. That's a little disappointing when you've put your heart and soul onto that canvas. But if you don't ever acknowledge that as a purpose, you cannot incorporate that into what you do so that you're more successful. It is all about re reaching your audience in the way that they can appreciate. So in your biography or personal profile, they want to see who it is they're working with here. And if you give them some historical facts, even if they're not certifiable or documented or public presentations, they still give the person who's reading it a sense of your public appearance or your interaction with society or your um, accomplishments in your pursuit. It's, a, it's a, something that represents your efforts and how you have made an advancement of territory, if you want to put it that way, in the public arena. So that's what that's all about. You can do it any way that you like. I just encourage you to make it a personal picture as well as you can. If you look at the worksheet I gave you, all I'm saying is your history, a brief history of your life. Even if you don't want to do it in a resume style, you can do it as a chronology or, or just a, a biographical sketch in words. And I say to include your original inspiration because that's what I'm always looking for when I'm working with either an entrepreneur or an artist. What is that fire that is pushing you out there and giving you the nerve to say, hey, come see me, come buy my thing, or whatever it is. It takes an awful amount of strength and courage to overcome the natural obstacles that all of us feel in laying ourselves out to the public. So what is it that drives you? And your, if you can communicate that to your audience in some way, they're going to identify with that because we all have that struggle and you are a real person who broke through that barrier. Everybody can identify with that kind of story. And what you envision for your future, it kind of tells them, are they gonna go with you? Or are they gonna enjoy the single performance? Hi. Hi there. I'm Eric Fetch. Eric, nice to meet you, Elizabeth. Hi, Elizabeth. Side, meeting after meeting here. Oh, okay. I'm going
going through these one by one because it is a logical progression to overcome the fears sometimes for an artist to say, okay, I have to do this and then I have to do that. And, and it gets you out of, I don't want to do anything or what do I do? If you have a prescription of some kind or at least some kind of yellow brick road, if you want to call it that, it helps you take the first step. After that, your personal uh, profile, bi a biography, your history, the resume is that list of accomplishments. It is the public accomplishment. And that's why, and when I'm thinking of that, I don't necessarily mean it has to be certifications, degrees, exhibitions, any of that. It can be anything, as I said, that is a public accomplishment that shows that you've made progress on your chosen road. You can't get too creative with that, really, Barry, so we'll move on. Where the rubber really meets the road is now with the internet and the way that we have to communicate in order to be received or even understood or even to be found on the internet. There are a lot of tips and tricks and all of that. Um, SCORE also has some beginning workshops for online marketing that you can take advantage of and they are free. Uh, they're presented by Kate Keeley who is the CenturyLink community representative and SCORE took hold of her because they were already giving those as free presentations or free anything she did was free and so SCORE took her under their arm and said, do it for us, and it's been a real success. You're totally welcome to get in on that anytime. If you go to their website, you'll find the events calendar, and that is um, coloradosprings.score.org. So if you go there, the calendar's there chronologically. You can take in what you can. But when you are working with the internet, we're talking a total different ballgame. Um, Eric, I was just, I was pointing out that when you, when you're a, an artist, you're, are you a visual artist or? Yeah, uh, watercolor. Watercolor, Painter. great. If you have a card, I'd like to have one. Oh, sure. And there's my card there. Oh, I do have one. Okay. So I was making the point that a lot of times artists are, are very open to having people come into their studio or enter their world, uh, obviously visit an exhibition you might put on, but you're, it's your world and they come into it. Um, with the internet, you're basically putting your world out there. And it's a it takes an effort, a little bit of an exposure level to do that. And so you have to kind of turn yourself around and, and anticipate how you're going to be received. And that's, that's tricky, but it's not as difficult as you might think if you say, if you see that the internet society or the community is a virtual society. And that means my definition of virtual was, is something like just like with the games, it's, it's a fantasy in some ways that represents something as it could be. And if you create that enticement or that introduction to your art or to your world on the internet, you want to be, it to be accurate to what is in the real world about you and your art. So that when they come to see you in reality, it's very much what they see online. Well, that's easy to do if it's your art. You put your art on the website, they come and they see the same art you know, at your gallery or whatever. Well, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about your world. You know, the fact that it's you and your life that all this comes from. And it is a social network. It is an exposure level that maybe you're not used to. We're talking about anybody can click onto that and find out something about you. It's something you have to decide. What level are you comfortable with? 
how much exposure can you take on that worksheet or the social media. The, the social network has put windows into your world to be seen as well as for you to see out. And it's a bit of a shock, I have to say, I went through all that, and when you realize that there's some, especially if you're going to, to enter in and engage, as in blogging or you know, Twitter or, or even Facebook, in terms of what you put out there is, is accessible to anyone, it has to be a living, moving thing, which means you have to make a certain level of commitment to maintain that and keep up your website, keep your website and your, your internet exposure up with what's happening in real life. And your life changes. Like Bill pointed out, your art changes. And you have to keep refreshing that so that they are tracking with you. And I think that's something that's sort of missing in what's going on with the social media right now is that it's, it's a parking spot or it's an address. It's like an empty building with a sign out front but you can't get in or you can't find anybody because they're not keeping hours. It's that same sort of thing. And so you do have to make an, a, a commitment to that and you have to see the benefit of having a website and having that social community. Maybe it, it's good enough for you the to websites, have an address. Yeah, they're, they're off, they're just like a billboard. Yeah. I mean, literally, I mean, they, they uh, I mean, I've like, looked at some blogs in the last two weeks. You know, one was posted in you know, April, That's it. Yeah. And it's like, okay. But then, no, then there's, that's not unusual. I mean, it's, it's no, it's very common. It's rare to find common. somebody that's, you know, thumping along out there. And then, yeah. But the thumpers are, are kind of dull. So I, that, that, to me, that's kind of the challenge is, is how to, you know, how to be involved without being dull. And being a dull it's person. a process, <laughs> I have to say, because I started to, when, when you first get the information about okay, make yourself a Facebook page or a LinkedIn page or whatever, or, or even a website. You get all excited, you get in there and you get it done and you think you've accomplished something. And then, you know, it turns out to be a year later and you've never been back there. So that happens. I've had that happen to me. And I made the decision at one point that I was going to make a commitment to being a participant in this virtual society. Um, I think I've covered the fact that the real time in computer language is a computer record of events as they occur. So if you have events going on, then you want to communicate that to your public. If you're in the brainstorming mode and you think it's, it's even if you don't think it's especially of interest to your audience, it is an expression of you and where you are and what's happening. Hi. Hi. I'm Elizabeth. Hi, Elizabeth Doris. Doris, nice to meet nice you. Nice to meet you also. There's one of my cars there, and I'd like to have one of yours if you have any. You know, I will. I think I left them in my purse because I won't carry that heavy old thing. Okay. So I will check. Let's go on to the website script. Did I leave you hanging with anything right there? Oh, so uh, your social network is what you make it. So if you abandon your site, they're going to know nobody's home. But that may not be accurate, right? What if you're so busy that you don't take the time to update your website or put new information on or load your new art? Or maybe somebody set up your website for you and you don't know how to load the pictures and so there it sits. I've run into that a lot. Well, so it isn't so much that nothing's happening as it's not connected to you. And so that's why there's a commitment required. And it is a, a great, huge time commitment and people don't realize that. It's also a cost commitment for your server, your website, host, or whatever it is. And if you need computer help, uh, you're going to have to have that support along the way, or you'll have to have 
um, classes to teach you how to do it, and I'm all for that. I think we're totally in a do-it-yourself era, especially when we have the technology and we don't have to hire it out. If we just knew a few things, it would make a lot of difference. When they invented um, management systems, which were not like, they were like Excel spreadsheets on steroids, you know. There was no end to the, to the massive amount of information that you could accumulate and have access to. When they broke that barrier, you were at the wheel of this mega tool that gave you the opportunity to do your own accounting and your own sales and your own uh, management and everything from that control board. So that was a huge difference that I don't think people have really gotten their hands around to make use of or even to understand in some cases because a lot of people are comfortable with Excel spreadsheets, for instance, because of its finite nature. But if you start filling that, I don't know if anybody has done that, but you can end up with, you know, how many columns across and try to access the information on there. This is, that's exactly why they come up with, came up with uh, the databases. You so can do anything in access that you can do in Excel. Yeah, and access will give you a switchboard so that you can easily access any of, the, any of that information any way you like. And I did some software development with my brother for business uh, owners in, in a small scale, individuals who are launching a business. And I know all about that development. And you're, there is so much software available that if you can think of it, there's probably a software offered for it. And you don't have to have custom designs, custom development, hardly anymore. Okay, uh, I'd like to meet you. I'm Hi, Elizabeth I'm Cindy Davies. I'm so sorry, Cindy. It's Cindy. nice to meet you. Yeah, if you have a card, I'd like to have it. Oh, and there's you. one of mine. Okay. okay. Take that. All right. And do you have a packet or no? Oh. Okay, so the last thing we'll quickly, I just want to make sure you got all the pieces first, and then I want to demonstrate some of the software I use and some of the things I've done using that approach. The last thing, the last worksheet I gave you is for website scripts. And this is, you can almost start with this nowadays if you're thinking about marketing your art at all because everybody kind of understands that it's a billboard or it's a storefront or it's an address that if you're not there you're, it's like not being in the phone book. Nobody uses a phone book anymore. So if you don't have... I've never seen a phone book. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even know how to use one. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah, believe me it's frustrating if you don't have the right terminology you're not going to find it. <laughs> so, if we were to start this whole discussion with the idea of setting up a website and having website scripts that work as a true expression of your inner creativity and the social world that is around you and the, the effort that you envision, if you were world famous, what would that culture look like that was built around you and your art? That's, that's a far reach, right? That's kind of a far reach. But if you think that way, you will start making those boundaries. You will start saying, well, you know, if I, and that's what I did. Okay, if I was Angelina Jolie, for instance, <laughs> and people knew every last thing about my life, and I couldn't stop them, would I be okay with that? Well, if I'm not, thankfully I'm not world famous, and I can choose the boundaries where that insight to my private life ends. And I think it's a good exercise for anyone to do in terms of taking off the glass ceiling or whatever it is that is inhibiting you from going out there and just laying it all out for the world to see. 
Another thing that inspires me and inspired me to do this workshop this way because I hope it's not like any other workshop you've ever had because this is my creative self to take the formats and the information and the formal things that I know and I use and throw them all up in the air and say, what do I want to do with that? And how do I want to use that? And what would be the best benefit of that will also preserve my creative spirit and not turn that into some other animal? That's what I wanted to do. So I did it my way. And it's an original work. <laughs> So the other thing is that last term on there, practice freedom of expression in words. For me, it's easy because I'm a writer. Hi, I'm Elizabeth. Cheryl, nice to see you. Nice to meet you. If you have a card, I'd love to have it. And I have cards here. Uh, luckily, we have, we just got another set. For me, writing has always been how I release that tension belt. And I know for artists, I found out, you know, that is, in, in, to me, the, the, the absolutely organic artist, it's not a thought. They just do it. And for me, I had to, to realize that I really could put what was in here on a canvas and, and I could be read by what I painted. When you're looking at something like, oh, this is a great example, Cynthia's work, and then Gail's work, if you can see that, you know, two very different expressions that say something about those individuals. You can almost write an interpretation of those personalities based on this. When I was in art school, after being in what I call beneath the Earth's crust, as a computer geek and a business developer and staying out of the limelight to find out that if I painted something with, you know, which I thought I was just following instruction, but when I got through, that professor could tell me what I was expressing and he would write. And I thought, how did you know that? I don't tell that to anyone. I don't show that to anyone. I just did what you told me to, and you told me what was in here. It really knocked me flat. In fact, I ran out of the room crying. I could not take it. It was extraordinary. It was a metamorphosis for me to have basically my heart ripped out of my chest and laid out, and people say, oh, that's what you are. It's hard, but I understand it now. I understand that connection, and that's the difference. I said earlier to Bill that and I've worked with entrepreneurs as a business counselor. And they, artists to me, are the quintessential entrepreneur. The difference being, and I work with SCORE as a, as a business counselor, and the difference in working with artists versus a, an individual who wants to start a, a business is with an artist, you're, I don't think, in some cases, they're experienced enough that their art is that far away from their heart. Maybe that far with an entrepreneur as a product, it's out there already. The minute they conceive of it, they see it in people's hands and out there walking the street or you know, it's out in the public. That's, that's initially their concept. Well, for an artist, it is too, but you're dragging their heart with them out there. And, and it's not something they're willing to say, okay, let's have a business plan. How are you gonna profit? What's your profit margin? What are your costs? approach it that way. But in operation, they are the same. They really operate the same. They're motivated the same way, unless I, I took issue with the fact that some, there are entrepreneurs who say, okay, I've got X amount of dollars to invest. I want X percent return. What kind of business can I do to get that? That's not what I'm talking about. And they will, if there are obstacles, they will overcome them with those same resources. For an artist or for a true gra grassroots entrepreneur, they're gonna overcome all those obstacles, including the fact that they have no money with this, and that's it. And that's what 
that's a force and, a, and an engine of motivation that I tap into, whether it's an entrepreneur or an artist. And for an artist, there is so much in the business world to strangle that, that I would like to be at least one person who protects that in the process of helping to be successful as you know, financially. That's not what this is about, this workshop. It's about truly expressing yourself genuinely so that people can understand who you are, what your art is about. Sometimes uh, I've found that people who buy art really like to have those little stories about what this art is all about, uh, where it came from, why the artist did it. And rarely do artists tell that. When I interviewed artists, I would ask them. That's exactly what I asked them. And they could tell me, but there was no way they were going to sit down and write the story. My first suggestion to make that whole thing easier is to either record yourself or have someone interview you and ask questions until you're talking about your art and you don't realize it. And then you can go back with your left brain, read it, look at it, hear it, and shape it so that it, it, it's a good representation. That's what I did. Now I want to show you a few things. This is, this is just five minutes long, this PowerPoint that I made, and it was a it was an anthropology study research project that I made um, about artists as a culture. And I did that for my capstone thesis for graduation. I, I had an interdisciplinary degree, art and writing, and that's what I did. Where did you get that degree? In Grand Junction, what is now Mesa, Colorado Mesa University. I used my shorthand ability and I turned it into a graphic.
I discovered in having doing these interviews and having the artists tell me without thinking what they were saying, what they, how they, the question was, what is creativity to you? And, and this, when I started this project, I thought, I felt like a journalist or, you know, an interview, a newspaper reporter, whatever. And a professor was the first person I interviewed about it on the project. And he says, well, if you're going to ask them, ask yourself first. I thought, what? You know, but I'm not really an artist, you know. And he said, well, if you want to know what they think, ask yourself first. So I did, and it took me a while to hone that in, to know and have a concept. So when, then it also enabled me to see whether I was an artist like they were or not. And I wanted to find out would I fit in the art community? Was I truly an artist, even if I could draw a few things? And what they told me through these interviews came out of their hearts, and they were looking, you know how it is when you're talking. You're seeing something, and you're talking as you see it. And that's the way they spoke to me. And so these comments, I don't know if they thrill you like they thrill me, but my gosh, you know, I had thought, oh, that is incredible. And one of the artists, um, Malcolm Childers, he was also a professor. And he talked about getting into your subconscious. And I thought, he's getting into mine right now, you know? <laughs> it was amazing. And he really opened my eyes to see how it is that art does that for people, even if they don't realize it. It's an amazing thing to me, especially in hard economic times, to have that ability to reach the subconscious and inspire and motivate. I think the arts turn the world around. That's what I think now. So that's the main reason I want to support it. Okay. After I did that, I wanted to make a website. I had the technology, the knowledge, and I thought, hey, this is great stuff. i got to put it out there. Well, I did, but I didn't know what to do with it after that for you know, a couple of years. This is my LinkedIn account, and I encourage anyone, any artist or any right brain person to get on LinkedIn, even though it's structured for business and resume and those kind, you know, job seeking, whatever, and the boxes are very rigid. I threw all kinds of junk in there. And so it'll have the normal stuff. But on there, I also put my website. Oh, no, sorry. This links over to another page on LinkedIn where you can upload documents or I put this PowerPoint on the web on the LinkedIn page. I had a, a presentation here about concepts that I put there. I put a poem that I wrote and then I didn't like the way LinkedIn because if you put up your load your resume on LinkedIn, it it's a program that selects keywords and plugs it into their format. And I didn't like that. So I uploaded my uh, it's not a resume, it's a background history. Um, the other thing, oh, here is down here, and, and I don't think many people know this. There, it says, it gives you a place to Backspace. Well, this is an extra window, so I'm going to close this. Yeah, you're right. Anyway, I don't think many people find this on when they go to my LinkedIn page, but they could also get to my website, which is not on the on the internet. It's within my Mac account, and a lot of your accounts have a website ability where it won't cost you anything and you can create a website on their template. 
and is accessible through your membership. And it has this long uh, website address, but you can put it on here, it says personal website, hopefully it'll work. There, and there's my website that's not on the World Wide Web, but through LinkedIn, it is. And I have these various, oh, I keep forgetting this isn't a Mac. I wanted to highlight my individuality, which has to do with the shorthand that I, I say on my PowerPoint, it's like an extinct, almost extinct language, you know, so I can call it a hieroglyph. And you have your links. I did a report, basically I wrote my project as an allegory because it was, it was an art degree and I wanted to incorporate what I had learned in graphic design and art and writing. So I, I did a project, so I put that on there and it was about the artist. That's one of my, uh, a section of one of my art pieces. Um, there's the biographies of the artists I interviewed um, I put on the exhibition where I pour my quartz, my capstone, and there in the background is the PowerPoint you just saw. I took pieces of my art and made abstractions because I didn't think my artwork was suitable. But there were, as I said, there are and if you look at some of my language, that's all I can show you because any expression you make is gonna be from your internal self. I can't tell you, write it this way, and I have no way of knowing how you would write it. So all I can do is show you how I wrote some of mine. And uh, mining my own data is a term that I like to use, or sometimes I say mining my own business. And what it is, is you have a wealth of information already. You have the history, your experiences, you have pieces you've done, performances you've, you've performed. You have all this history, you have contacts, you have people that you know. So you have, you know, for me, that's all data. And we don't turn around and look in our own closets and see what's there. But if you'll do that, you will find, and if you don't already have a contact list, you can create a, a contact list. You can put notes on there as to, I always put notes on what was the connection when I met this person. Those, to me, those are the connections that make this virtual culture around your art, are those, those really motivational things that why a person came to see your art why you appreciated the person who told you something about your art, those are living vibrations that if you can encapsulate that in terminology, some kind of verbiage of your own, it starts to, to expand what's in here to, in, to include other people. And it's easier when you base it off actual connections if you want to create a connection, and I, I have to say that I did this myself for a while, well, I want this kind of culture around my art or my writing. So I try to construct it and say, well, come here and be this way, is basically what I was saying. That really doesn't work, especially on the social network, because people want to be themselves there, and they want to bring a little bit of their personal life into it. And it, it could be a real explosive thing, it has been, if you read some of these books. So, if you're able to create a vignette, for lack of a better term, some sort of iconic picture of how you see yourself and where you would invite people in and how they might communicate with you, they're looking for those sort of cues. So you can think in those terms. It takes a lot of uh, vision. But what I say is these are, I look for segments in my art that have energy and move me. Even 
after I've done something, I can look on, at, at something I've done and say, ooh, I really hate that. And I maybe I said slash it or something. And then I say, but except for this. And so I took those little pieces and I said, boy, I don't know what it is, but those little things, you know, they're, they're grabbing me. And I don't know if they grab anybody else, but I'm saying, this is what grabs me. And that kind of insight is what Facebook and what all these social network, all that energy is, is all about. Those true and raw and almost primal expressions. And that's why it's taken off with the youth, I feel pretty sure, because you know, I'm not inclined to behave that way. <laughs> and it is difficult for us as older people to say, ah, whatever, you know, so I look like a fool. You know, no, not inclined to do that. But I had to reach that point and say, my kind of foolishness is a certain kind of art. My kind of mistake could be a treasure. You know, you read the book Outliers, for instance. It's those kinds of quirky things that don't fit anywhere that actually make you interesting. And on this website, there is a place for a blog. And I started to use it. Chris Brogan, who's written Trust Agents, is a great book for getting an insight to the social network and, and how that all works and why it works and how, why it's not going away. He is like the guru as far as I'm concerned about that. Chris yes. Brogan. Chris, Chris Brogan, B-R-O-G-A-N. It's called Trust, Trust Agents. Agents. And I forget the subtitle, but one of the points he makes is that the thing about the internet is once you've blogged something, well, you can delete this, but in some places on the internet, they're there forever. You go away, you grow up, you you know mature, it's still gonna be there. <laughs> and that's something to consider too. But it, for my money, if you're being sincere and you're on a pursuit, especially as an artist, that process is intriguing to, to many people. And it's not going to be exactly like anyone else's. Even though the artists I interviewed for this project, my English teacher, professor, who was criticizing my art, I should say critiquing, but he really was criticizing it, <laughs> he said, well, they're kind of all saying the same thing. But he wasn't an artist. You know, those little nuances are perceived by people who are searching and, and, and they're looking for their little pocket. And that, that, that little bit of inspiration or that connection, these are all pretty much subconscious connections. So if you put something on the road to, like Twitter has a really bad reputation for that in some ways, you know, oh, I'm drinking my coffee now, I'm gonna go out for a walk, you know, I mean, but they were playing. And there's, I really encourage you to play with any tool that's available to you because you, anymore you can't destroy anything like you could in the early days of computers. Can you blog once here and then go yeah. to Facebook, Twitter, or whatever? What I do is I blog there and then, or actually I don't blog there because it's not publicly accessible really, but I blog on my uh, LinkedIn account and I also take the same blog and put it on my Facebook page. And in LinkedIn, you, you can check and it'll automatically go to Twitter as well, which is nice. So it's really, you know, you can do a lot of things without any expense laid out. You can get these free accounts and practice or play at blogging. And they do, they stay out there. If you check your, your Twitter account, like I went back, you know, months later and said, oh yeah, I did create that Twitter account, and I put some, so what did I say? Went back there and thought, hmm, okay, it's there. <laughs> you know, you deal with it. And, but as my life shifted and changed, and I tried this and I tried that, there is, people have an intuitive perception that that is your path on the 
road to wherever you're going. And, and that's that human experience that we share subconsciously, I think, is what is picked up from that. I mean, sure, you'll have critics and maybe people who have just really, I mean, it's happened to the best of people who know what they're doing. They s it didn't consider it a mistake, but somehow it was perceived as some infraction and they were run up the flagpole. Well, Chris Brogan makes the point, and his, his co-author, that if you go on honestly and say, oh, didn't know it would get you that way, um, sorry, this is what I meant. I thought it was harmless, but apparently it's not, and sorry, won't happen again. There's another acceptance. There's a forgiveness cycle in that, just as there is in any friendship. And if you can get a grip on that, that it really is, and that's, that's why I recommend Chris Brogan's book, because they make that point that it really is a reflection and a, a shadow that follows you, that is a true expression of what you, who you are and what you're about, just as it is in real life. It's just gone to the globe, you know, the whole world. But there's that same, he's making the point that there's that same social mores government going on and you can have a certain confidence about those dynamics that are common to everyone. There are going to be predators, violators, he addresses that. And in many cases, just like they do in society, they're more comfortable among themselves. And if they come out, you know, they're pretty much going to be policed in some way. And if they find it discouraging to be too public, so they're maybe off doing, like he says, they're not going to be doing anything, anyone enough good for them to be embraced. So there's a certain regulation going on that is not, um, that isn't a, a thing that we necessarily have to police, although you, you could be a victim of a predator. There's no doubt about that. And that's why I encourage you to go to Kate's workshop because she covers some of those safeguards, how to protect your information, things like that. Very helpful. I wanted to show you one of the things I use for brainstorming. And we couldn't, unfortunately, because I, was, I have a Mac, the connections weren't compatible and so my, I wanted to show you this program. It's called, and you won't see it up there, unfortunately. So that's why I have this nearby, and I apologize if you can't see it real well. This is, this particular program is called Free Mind. Have you ever heard of mind mapping? Mm -hmm. Okay. See, I find artists, people in that venue really have seen this, and, and in the business world, they, they don't, unless it's busy or corporate corporations. That's what I use. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. uh, I did project. Yeah. I just found it to be really, well, it pulled me like a rubber band back into the corporate scene, and I was trying to break that. So um, the free mind, this is a, a free, or at least when I got it, it was free. So it's, it's free mind. But you can Google mind mapping, and there's a lot of programs offered out there. I like this one because it's, it's simple, it's simplistic. I started this one, I don't know if you can read it all, but I just, you know, you can label it any, I love the fact that if you use the right software, you make it serve you. You don't have to conform to it, and that's one of the joys of a Mac environment is they, it's designed for a human perception and not the corporate environment, and you have to conform to that format. 
which is useful in itself, but for instance, Access works extremely well in a Microsoft environment. It doesn't work so well. If they have something like that, the if you're running Linux, you're on Star Office. Star Office, I'll make a note of that. Yeah. So I really want to develop a piece of software, a switchboard that has no, you know, super duper graphics that people need to navigate a new software. I, I can create the tool for myself because I know how if I had it and I, you know, I've created a, a section in my hard drive for a, a Mac, I mean a Microsoft environment where you can do that too. But, you know, I don't want to switch off my Mac. So if I can get a, a, a software where I can create a database, uh, a relational database or just an accessible database, I can put all my stuff in there and then create a switchboard that says, go get that for me. I'll go get that and sort it any way I like. This, to go back to why I brought this up, the free line, this is one that I did, just started putting up things that I was working on when I got here in Springs to try to understand the art community here to see whether I would fit, if there was anything I could do, whatever. And anything that happened to me or that I felt was connecting, I just made a node and you can do this as simply as going up here and put a little light bulb and you pop it and it gives you a box and you say, okay, right now it's copper. Now I can put all things copper in that little box. I have Facebook here as a box, and I can expand out and see, oh, what can I do with Facebook? Link to my website, that turned out to be handy. I can make announcements there, I can get feedback. If I choose LinkedIn, what did I see there? Um, link to my website. It's static, available for new developments. Safe, neutral associations and exchange. One of the first things I discovered about taking something personal into the business environment is you don't realize it, but there it's a, it's a culture of its own and there are safety measures in it, there's policing, and so it's, it's a safe environment to a large degree. And LinkedIn reflects that safety of the business culture. So, for instance, it requires that you know the person, and you can get around it, of course, but if you cultivate that attitude where you have to either be a friend or a business associate, or you have some relationship, some known attachment to the person that you're inviting to be connected in your network, there are certain safeguards to make it more, more of a, sa a safe environment for business purposes. And so I found it to be very helpful, even if you're gonna do art pursuits commercially, you can use it as a place. And, and I had the same reaction most people do when I got on it. Okay, they want me to upload a resume. I don't have a resume. You know, maybe somebody would say, I don't have a resume. Skip that. It says, uh, create this profile. And it's all, you know, what's your job history and all that. Well, I don't want to do it that way. There's no, you know, there's no form fuzzies here at all. But, so I just started throwing them in there. And I'm a real conformist, and having started, you know, my life in the corporate environment, it's, it's ingrained in me. And so when they say, do it this way, I do it that way, and I think, well, it doesn't work, so I'll go somewhere else. Well, I say, darn it, that's just a box. We'll put whatever I want to in it. And so I started throwing all that other stuff in it, and, and I wanted to see if artists would be willing to create pseudo business network in LinkedIn and use it the way we want to use it. 
and have it interaction the way we prefer it, not necessarily for the strict business connections that LinkedIn is designed for. All I have to say is be careful about the groups that you join if you want to join some groups because they won't let you opt out if you change your mind. And I don't like that. I joined one for museums and um, galleries and I thought that would be a great connection for discussion and all. It turned out it wasn't because it was shop talk between among museum uh, curators and as you would expect, I mean, normally. But I thought, oh, well, that's where all the artists are and, you know, that'd be a great connection. Well, it, their discussion really doesn't interest me. But I did find... Pardon me? Yes. And I did find one that I, that I really loved and they had some great discussions. Um, I think it's best practices that, you know, art, well, anyway, if you want these details, I'd be happy to send them to you by email. Hi, I'm Elizabeth. Hi, I'm Ann Patch, I'm Eric Schwartz. Mm -hmm. Oh, nice to meet you. I used to be on the board here at Coppers, I had to. Oh, okay, great. Thanks for coming. Okay, so I'll close that one and I'll show you one that I started, kind of started today. Should you start selling your art workshop? Should you start selling your art? I got this as a spin-off from SCORE because they have a should you start your own business workshop. And now they call it Business Basics. That's a free workshop. If you're interested, you should take it up. But so I took that terminology because as an artist, maybe you don't really want to sell your art, but you do want to have it to have more exposure or maybe you do want a website just in case anybody's interested or you're talking to somebody and they want to, you know, it's a, it's a portable portfolio you don't have to carry around with you. There are a lot of advantages to just having a parking spot. So deciding if you're going to sell your art is another level. It, it entails a lot more than if you stop to consider what, it, what ramifications Taking, undertaking by selling, deciding to sell your art, you might, you know, it'll save you making mistakes or losing resources or experiencing grief that you didn't anticipate. Just to step back and say, yeah, I want to put my art there, so you assume, okay, I'm going to sell my art. So I go start, you know, beating the path and sidewalk and looking for galleries that'll show my art, you know, that's that's pretty common, a, a pretty common approach. If you sit back and you say, well, who do I know? What galleries might be interested in my art? And I, I would tend to ask an artist, where, what kind of gallery do you see your art in? And nine times out of ten, it never, they never thought of that just to even think, you know, if I was successful or if I was really happy, what would be the environment? Can I add something to that? Yeah. That's kind of a fallacy. If okay. you're trying to sell art, mm -hmm. you have to research what is selling in the area. Yeah. You have to know not necessarily where you would see your art, but what is selling in that area? What does it look like? Is it similar to what you, you're, you're doing? I would never put a photographer in a gallery that specializes in oils. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it just doesn't, doesn't fit. It's not going to sell. Um, but if it's you know the vibe is right for the photographer, if he feels good about it, you know, he might want to put something in there. But I would never do that. Right. I, yeah. Actually, you know, I that's see. That's a huge thing. People because they think people don't research what's going on around them. Also, though, as you pointed out, most of the artists here don't sell their art. And so that's one of the reasons I asked the question, you know, because a lot of artists were trying to sell their art here when their art was really suitable for some other venue. region. Yeah, some other venue. So there are a lot of things to consider. And 
a lot of people as artists don't consider that the fact that they're buying materials you know to produce art is actually a, a cost of what would be a business and their time that they put in the support circles that they have to get off the ground that those are all resources that in a business uh, design it would have a slot in the budget and we don't think of it that way entrepreneurs often don't think of it that way which is why you know, it's so helpful so one of the basics so I just made a couple of little notes here what are your resources who's your audience and a common question I would ask people is, is do you have a body of work that could be a one person show and sometimes they don't have that or it's not framed or you know there's a lot of obstacles to that but if you can get to the point where you have a body of work to show that is a really great starting point and what kind of people are responding to your art or your performances what what's going on we're we're always pushing forward without looking to see what we've accomplished and there's a lot there a lot there to pull together so that's uh, a program that I like to This program only shows one map at a time. So if you close that map, you basically close the program. But I'm done with all this, and I'm going to test it now. The other thing I wanted to show you is a collection of examples Actually, this one, you were able to put on, on Christina's computer from a flash drive, my file. Well, I tell you, it's, it's really a problem getting old. Eyeglasses. Okay. I pulled some examples. Now, part of the examples that I that I throw into this mix as far as our statements or communications was my PowerPoint presentation because I was also going to tell you that when I interviewed these people and took with my shorthand verbatim what they said, I would read it back to them and say, this is what you said. Is, is that a true, would you agree with that? I mean, did I get it right? And a lot of times they they hear that and say, did I say that? Um, let me think about that. Yeah, yeah, I guess that is how I feel. So when we're speaking, we often don't realize the expressions that are coming straight out of our creative self, you know, because we are vision envisioning something as we talk. We're seeing something in our mind's eye. And so we're not keeping track, we're not putting in any order or preparing it for someone as you would, you know, with the left brain or for writing. So that's why I suggested earlier for, for those of you who came in a little late, is that you use either a, a recording of yourself talking about your art or have someone interview you and have it recorded and then listen to what you say about your art or your journey, whatever's happened. because you're expressing it is not the way you would write it, but it gives you those core elements that you don't think of when you're sitting down with a pencil and paper. I think it works well. It worked well for these artists. It worked well for me to look at those statements and order them into a written document for other people to read. Okay, this I pulled these statements from a website in the UK, basically for, to make sure I wasn't invading anyone's privacy over here. And you, you know, you can, I can share this website with you too because it's, it's public and they're showing their art. But I didn't want you to look at their art and read their statements. I wanted you to, to see what they were saying without any preconception 
of your interpretation of their art. This first one is the longest one. Okay, just for sake of the recording, I'm gonna read part of this. My work explores basic human emotions geared toward the screen image. We are bonded, bar bombarded 24 seven by these moving images. They provoke subconscious reactions that ultimately affect our day-to-day -day existence. My work questions these human instincts of joy, sadness, elation, anger, fear, heartache, etc. Why do we cry when we watch a sad film or feel uplifted when things turn out all right in the end? It's not real. Is it through sound and vision we are affected in such a way as if we were actually involved in the storyline, etc.? And so just superficially, if you're an English major, you're seeing all kinds of structural problems, right? Spelling problems, grammar. So that's a distraction. And so the construction and even the way you lay out your paragraphs can be a distraction. One of the advantages of putting this sort of information on a website is you can move it around, you can put it in little boxes everywhere. It doesn't have to be a paragraph. You can have little statements. In fact, it makes it more interesting if you do put isolated statements or like call out boxes or whatever. And it gives a person a chance to toggle between looking at your art and seeing what you say about it and about your journey. After that statement, and he's doing photography, by the way, he went straight into, it says, recently completed a teaching certificate, currently lecturing for a college and running art classes. A little scary, you know, if, if you think of him as a teacher. But his accomplishments, and then right below that, he's uh, listing, his, well, he is a member of an association, and then oops, this very lengthy list of his exhibitions. So obviously he's very experienced and has a lot there. But when you're faced with a list like that, are you gonna read through every one of them or even scan it? Probably not. So what is it really accomplishing? I think you look in terms of what your reader is experiencing when they're, when they're looking at this. And sometimes you can group these things together and put a few details there. And maybe this would be better on, you know, if you have a resume and a biography, for instance, I guess that's why I separated the two, because if you do a biography or a personal profile, you can give them the big view in conversational terms, and then if they want to see exactly what where you were and when, you can have a resume list, but I wouldn't put it all on the same page. You know, you could have it something somewhere separately, but The next one is really a contrast to that. Very short. Born in Bristol, England, studied art from a young age, specialized in natural history illustration. Before completing a degree, his biography, he worked primarily in oils, he had a distinctive style, deliberately pushing, uh, this is all about his technique, and exhibited my work with the Wildlife Art Society, regularly sketch for, sketch for live subject matter. You know, the, to me, the, this is far more interesting, but it makes you want a little more detail. And I, I love that, because if you can pique your audience's curiosity, it tells me something as a writer, that if I start with a short encapsulation like that, that you could, insert a link if they wanted more detail, but you're not distracting from their experience by putting it all on the same page. How about Dorothy? Oh, I love Dorothy, look. I paint and create for fun, and only when I'm happy, I try to reuse materials, combine different media, and make something out of anything. I hope you'll enjoy my stuff.
period. That's it. <laughs> Anything works if it's true to you. This one did, wrote about himself in the third person. His practice focuses around his association with childhood memories and how they relate to the suburban landscape of Coventry, depicts scenes, scenes which are isolated from life, distant from any sign of existence, returning and subtracted to core information. Wow, you know, that's pretty deep. And I, you know, you sort of leave that thinking, huh? What do you mean? But for me, I want to I want to know how this guy's brain is working. For me, I'm that kind of person. So if he elaborates a little more, I'm going to be happy. He does go through a little more experience. It's all talking about Russell, you know, this other guy. And sometimes that helps you construct some language if you talk about yourself. Another technique I use is I write a letter to a friend. I'm not going to send it. But I start, I put myself as if I really am going to send this letter to my friend, and I'm describing what I'm doing. And it, it also gives you some very good language. He has his, his um, not a resume, but basically his accomplishments, exhibitions. There aren't many, but he lists them, and you should list them and be proud of them if it's one. I'll tell you what I'm proud of. I sold one painting, and I sold 24 copies of my allegory. I want some more of that, you know? But if it's the only thing I ever accomplish, I feel somewhat successful that someone looked at that painting and said, I got to have it. Boy, that sends me already. And to have sold 24 copies of my allegory as an artistic expression uh, even if I don't even know why or care why they bought them, maybe they were just supporting me, you know, maybe they thought it was something that I didn't really pull together the way they hoped, whatever, they were motivated in some way to have a copy for themselves. And I love that. I love that the whole sensation. It's amazing. And it, what it means to me is that they connected with something I expressed. And one of the phrases I put in my in my book was, you know, it's amazing to me that one can put out some expression from their heart and have it received. The same message that was sent out by that one can be received by another one. It's an, to me, it's all new and amazing and vibrant. And I think that's why these artists were so willing to work with me because I was genuinely fascinated about their life. This, this uh, artist is so intriguing, uh, daughter of a painter, lived in France, met Pavel Picasso during that time, but instead of going abstract, she went to a high degree of realism. To me, to the innermost part of me, art is a language, and as the divine child artist in us paints, Harmonies are born, and the language becomes a song of love and light. Wow, what a spirit. It's a little lofty, but I'm telling you, there are some, some souls out there, and I, I was probably one of them, that says, how can anyone say anything like that in two or three sentences and just describe something that apparently is so at home to her and so alien to me that I think, how does a human being get there? <laughs> so I guess the whole point of this is that no matter what you say, it's, it's a true expression, it's a re revelation of you as an individual. Every individual is unique, and so your expression uh, is unique. There are similar or even identical experiences that we share with people, but almost never in the exact sequence. And so it's always going to be different. The details are what make it rich. And the oddities and the quirks, the quirkier the better as far as saying, yeah, I totally identify, but there has to be that identification with, with your audience. And this is the struggle I had. You know, I could be totally out there. For instance, I could get into computer technology, 
and leave, they'll, they'll be nodding and smiling. And it took me a long time to realize that they were nodding and smiling. That's all that was going on. So you want to connect with them. And so to make sure that there is some overlap between your experience and theirs, it takes some work to realize where that is. And that is the place, that little cusp right there, is where you want to uh, park yourself on the internet so that you always have one foot in general reality and a door, like Malcolm says, what I do, I lay it out there on the table because it could be a ramp for someone else into another world. I, he couldn't have, nobody could have said it better as far as I'm concerned. It is. It's, it's, a, it's an avenue, an open door for someone to experience something entirely besides their normal experience. Artists of all kinds offer that to the public, and I think it's especially important in hard economic times because nobody really is motivated to break those barriers, overcome those obstacles without having a vision of something beyond it. And if you're an extremely practical person who's looking for the bottom line and the feasibility of everything that you undertake, you're boxed in. And artists can break that box and send you on your way. So I think, I think at this point in history, which is why I've decided to devote time with that and really make the commitment to helping artists because they're offering a service that is really needed at this point. Okay, I'm going to stop there, and I would like uh, to take any questions that you might have for the rest of the time that we have left. Do you recommend any particular website or, or other, like, I'm on Fine Art America right now, another one too, it doesn't come to mind, but uh, in terms of, you know, easy, easy place to throw up a website. I, I tend to recommend what I said as far as a starting point. If you have a server, you know, your internet provider probably has some kind of platform that you can play with because there are certain fundamentals, but you're, if you're already experienced with that, there are some recommended in the books. Actually, I was going to tell you about the book that I... Sorry, I didn't bring that with me. I meant to. It was actually the the book, the textbook, the book we used as a textbook for uh, arts management class that I was in for, and we did learn to, you know, do a uh, curate a, an exhibition and manage an exhibition, advertise, and all that. And it was called, I think it was Arts Management 101. That's the name that comes to mind for this book. And I actually want to find out if I were to construct a workshop for artists, I would probably see about having that book available because the advice, advice in there as compared to some other books that I've read uh, is all about what I'm talking about rather than, well, this is what you're gonna have to do if you're gonna be successful. So I found it very practical, very current, and it had some great websites. There is one, actually, I can find it. No, I can't. I'm not on the internet here. But I have on my favorite places, sometimes I just, if I find those, I throw them on there. And there again, if you would like to have some of those, if I, I'll make a list and send it to you if you'd like to have. Would you all like to have that? I, I can just send it to all of you if, if I have your cards or uh, I guess in some cases Doris or, or whoever. Um, I'll need your email address to send you a list of the places that I've found or the books that I think that would be worth your time. I'd be happy to do that. What other questions are there? Did I reach the objectives that you were hoping to gain by coming? Or am I just not touching on something that you really need to know? <laughs>